Okay, as usual, we are going to have a very interesting guest in our studio today. And today we have the CEO of Catcher Digital Berhad, Eric. Hi, Eric. Welcome to the show. Hi, Frankie. Good to be here. Big fan of your show. It's an honor to, oh, to be here. Thank you so much. Thanks for your support, even though we are both in the media business. <laughs> <laughs> well, before the interview, I actually went to your LinkedIn page and do a little bit of digging about you, right? Fantastic. I mean, you graduated from LSE, first class honors are more. Statistics with finance, that's like mathematics, which is something that uh, I give up right along the way. Subsequently, right after you graduated, you joined Catcher as the analyst to the CEO office 2017, which is coincidentally a very interesting year for Catcher. We will go into that a bit later. But what's more impressive is that while you were an analyst in the CEO office, you also founded a couple of companies over there. So I suppose you are very familiar with the startup scene and you're also very familiar with uh, company valuation and things like that. And I suppose because of that, you brought some of those expertise into Catcher Digital as well. So today we are going to dwell a little bit deeper about those strategy and how are you going to use your skills to actually build this uh, business, right? So let's start off with 2017. A very interesting year for Catcher, which during that time was called Ref Asia Berhad, right? For those who are not familiar, Ref Asia, they came up with brands like Says.com, Obulan, and stuff like that. And in 2017, the company was sold to Media Prima for 105 million ringgit. Subsequently, because they sold the core business to Media Prima, this entity became a cash company. In Bursa, Malaysia, technical term is called GN2. And GN2 will require the company to actually uh, restructure itself to come up with a new core business. So I suppose my first question to you is that after you join a company, 2017, when a company has no core business, what were you assigned to do at that time? Okay, I think that's going to be a bit of a history kind of background a little uh -huh. bit so that we can clarify the lay of the land a little bit. So when I joined Catcher, I actually joined Catcher Group the okay. parent company of Ketcha Digital Berhad, or back then it was called Ref Asia Berhad. So you can think of Ketcha Group as an investment firm that focuses in the digital uh, space. Uh, we buy, we build, we invest in uh, startups and digital businesses. And uh, in the past 20 years, uh, we have been very fortunate to be part of uh, companies that like iProperty that buy and sell and rent a property online. It was part of REA Group and today is uh, part of Property Guru iCar, which is uh, equivalent in car, uh, both of which were listed in Australia and subsequently acquired by Carson a couple of years ago. We were also involved in a media business called iFlix, which was subsequently sold to uh, Tencent uh, during the pandemic. So catch up group as an entity, you can see as like an investment holding company that has a few things uh, under its belt. So when I joined Ketcha Group, I was working at the group level and pretty much have to do everything across the spectrum, right? Sometimes you think about what new businesses to build. Sometimes you think about what business to invest in or we uh, acquire businesses to build a, a business. It's always very thesis driven, right? So we, we decide on, hey, let's go into a certain business uh, or in certain industry and then we figure out what's the best way to go about it. So when I joined Ketcha Group, uh, what happened was shortly prior to that, Ref, the operating business, was sold to Media Prima. Then Ketcha Digital, or back then it was called Ref Asia, was classified as a GN2 company. We were given a couple of years by Bursa to figure out what to do with the entity if we don't inject a new uh, operating asset. Operating asset meaning companies that make money, uh, generate cash flow and has uh, actual business, then we would have been delisted. Mm. So it took a couple of years to figure out what's the right business to be in because it's easy to say, hey, we're going to buy something and then to figure out whether what's the right thing, the, the right people, the right processes comes in later on and, and it, it, it took us a while. Right? It took us a while. We met a couple of businesses that we thought we wanted to inject and then when you did the due diligence, you realize, hey, maybe those are not that great of a business. And then one thing led to another COVID hit. And then Bursa, because of COVID, decided to give us a bit of extension. And that was the time when we decided to invest in a business called I mean, Asia Syndrome Berhad. Uh, and it was a company that was founded by the ex-employees of Ref, who have worked in the, the digital media business for a long, long time. So that's how iMedia came to be. Because they were industry veteran, when they started a business, they had a lot of relationships, a lot of experiences. They managed to grow the business pretty fast, right? So between uh, 2020, when we launched the business officially in mid-2020, business was doing zero, right? And then um, within three years, the uh, business was doing five, seven uh, million of profit a year. And then on the way there, we thought, hey, you know what? Maybe we should inject the business into uh, Ketcha Digital Bahad. Subsequently, we had to change them because of copyrights issue. Uh, it was a very long and arduous process because Bursa is generally quite strict uh, about what kind of businesses that can be listed. And because the business was at the time two years old, 
so we had to put in place a lot of guardrails and a lot of performance threshold to make sure that it will meet a listable business criteria. You know, it hit a certain uh, profit threshold uh, and will continue to hit the profit threshold. Fortunately, uh, after two, uh, almost three years of, of the process, uh, it was subsequently uh, completed. So as of last March 2023, we completed the acquisition of iMedia. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, in end of July last year, we completed a regularization plan, which was a plan to get us out of GN2. So the acquisition of iMedia was completed in March 2023, which kind of explained why Ketcha's share price shot up tremendously during that time. I mean, if you compare with other media companies, right, Media Prima was flat throughout the whole 2023. Astro, it was on a downtrend. And you guys were one of the very few media companies that actually on the upward trend. So maybe that iMedia acquisition was one of a very important milestones for you guys. I also read from the news that the finale for you to come out from the GN2 was an exercise, a rights issue exercise to raise funds. Yeah. You were intended to raise about 41 million ringgit via rights issue. I think it was a one-to-one -one rights issue. For context, if you're an existing shareholder holding 1,000 shares, for example, and you are given the rights to subscribe up to 1,000 shares at a predetermined price level, I think the price was 23 and a half cents. But the interesting thing is this, right? You, you intended to raise... 41 million ringgit. But at the end of the exercise, you only managed to raise 29.7 million. Yeah. Uh, it's a half cup, full, half cup, empty yeah. kind of scenario. Yeah. So what do you think about this exercise, 29.7 million? This was a great question because I think there's twofold to that. We started the regularization process before I joined the business, right? So I think it was like 2020, the process started. So all this like rights issue price, how much you want to raise was determined back then when mm. iMedia was only doing no less than two million worth of profit a year. So we thought, okay, like this seems to be a, a sensible valuation. We're gonna complete the exercise in a year time, and then it got dragged on for one year, and then two years, and everyone got reasonably frustrated for many reasons, right? There's many external things that we were not aware of. We were ill-advised in, in certain situations. So by the time we were doing our rights issue, iMedia was doing close to uh, seven million of profit a year. And between then to the point I wanted to do a rights issue, we have to determine the price. It was two, two and a half years of gap. Right. right. So business has grown tremendously. Mm. So we had this very weird situation where on one end, we would like to raise as much money as we can. But on the, on the other end, hey, 23 and a half cents is pretty cheap to invest in a business that has grown tremendously over, over the years. So internally, we had a lot of debate. Like, hey, do we promote our rights issue or not? Like if people invest as dilution to existing shareholders, uh, if people don't invest, it will look like it's a failed exercise, right? So in the end, we did a bit of kind of promotion to our existing shareholders to make sure they know, hey, we're coming up exercise. And to be honest, that 29.7 million of capital raise was way better than what we expected. We were oh, expecting really? the worst. So how it was structured was out of the 41 million, if I remember correctly, it was 18 million that was committed by the major shareholder uh, mm. catch-up group. As long as that is committed, that is wired, the job is done. Mm. So we are ready for the worst case scenario because we didn't really need the money to run the business. The business was already profitable. Uh, so anything on top of that, you can say it's a bonus for us. So the, the thinking at the point was, okay, let's just make sure that people know that we're getting our GN2. We have been in hibernation for a long time. We trigger an email to all our shareholders and say, hey, uh, we are doing a rights issue, we are buying these assets, and we get a lot more overwhelming responses from our shareholders. Uh, and that was very unexpected. We were expecting, oh, probably a raise a couple of millions from the public, maybe 20 over million job done. But turned out there were about 11 or 12 millions of, of participation from the public. Uh, and we were quite happy with that, honestly, that even we have been in hibernation in, in some ways for three, four years, we see the same people that have been supporting us for the longest time, right? And then we had a briefing for a rights issue. A lot of people came and said, hey, finally, you guys are getting out of GN2. <laughs> I've been a shareholder since like 2012. Uh, I'm very glad to see that this is happening. Uh, this is very exciting. It's a very similar team uh, working in a, a much more exciting space. Uh, we're very happy to support. So to us, it was a great outcome. Like, it was a process to us to get out of GN2. So mm. we just have to go through the motion. Okay, yeah. maybe you can help us to explain why that would help to come out from GN2 because uh, when you're already GN2, you are, you are a cash company. Yeah. You already have a lot of cash. Mm. So why do you still need to raise more cash? Please? So in short, uh, to get out GN2, we need to complete a regularization plan. And the regularization plan consists of three part process, right? So one is that you find an asset that you want to buy that's good, approved by, by the regulators. 
Uh, second is then you need to figure out uh, how much you pay for it and, and where do you find the cash to pay for it. So at the time, I, if I remember correctly, like we have probably have a few million worth of cash left because we already dividend out most of the money to our mm. shareholders. Uh, so the, the transaction was set up to be 10 million at base and then based on performance, it could go up to 40 million, which they hit all the performance criteria. So then uh, what happened is that, hey, the deal was done such that 40 million out of 40, 22 should be paid in shares. So we did a share swap with the founders or the shareholders of iMedia. 18 was to be paid in cash. So the amount raised for the rights issue is to pay the cash portion of that. So that was why we needed to raise the 18 million to pay for the transaction. Uh, and then the final bit is just to get approval from SC to be exempted from a mandatory takeover. This is a bit mm. of technical where uh, because the transaction involves a certain threshold and above certain threshold, we are supposed to offer to all shareholders to buy yep. them out. Uh, but but in this scenario, we didn't want to do that. And then mm. we get an exemption from SC. So after we completed the three-part process, we then got a final approval from Bursa to lift it uh, of our GN2 status. Right. At the similar time frame, you also launched this new thing called the iGovernment, which uh, specifically focused on working to develop uh, tech solutions for yep public services and yeah. things like that. Can you share more about this, this sure. government? Sure. And how iGov came about was, for our line of work, we typically start with thesis, right? Why we want to invest or, or acquire businesses in a certain vertical. We started software, going to different verticals. And through the process, we met a lot of companies that try to digitize or serve the public sectors. I'll use the word public sectors. You know, some work for the government, some work for the for local council, mm. and, and really it's like a bunch of them. And because we were going through the GN2 process, it was uh, very difficult to to convince people that we're serious, that we are here to acquire, and we want to lay the groundwork because at the GN2 process for the first eight months of 2023, we practically can't do anything from a corporate standpoint. We have to stay status quo, can't do anything that will change any single thing on the circular, mm. but we need to lay ground. We can't just sit there and do nothing right. uh, for eight months. So we, we went out to meet a bunch of companies and there are many companies that does very interesting work for different segments of the public sector. So we decided at some point, hey, I think we need to tell the market that we're serious about this endeavor. Uh, let's set up a proper unit and tell the market that, hey, we are very interested in this space. Therefore, once we announce a PR, we can't really retract, right? So people know, hey, these guys are serious. Uh, we're on the hook if we don't do anything about it. And then it just make the, the conversation a lot easier because it's a new segment for us. I see. Yeah. So... Is there any progress in this segment or you have gone back to your core, which is the iMedia? Uh, always, always. So mm. this will be part of our uh, kind of software pillar. Uh, it's ongoing conversation. Uh, I think the tricky thing as we have learned over the past one year about trying to invest in this segment is that it's not a very direct uh, environment to be in because to serve the government sector and us being a public listed company, we need to make sure that we do everything by the books. We want to help digitize the country. We think there's tremendous commercial opportunities in, in this market. There's so many things that we can point to, like Singapore or, or the European countries that they did a lot of great work to digitize the economy and, and through public sectors. But for us to get into this sector, it's typically a bit slower, right? Because public sectors uh, tend to move slightly slower. Two, it's many nuances within that kind of relationship web, right? Uh, and we want to make sure that we go into a sector where there's commercial uh, opportunity that makes sense for us as a business. Second is that we can go in in a very transparent manner and make sure that whatever we do is above board. And sometimes it's not so straightforward in, in this space. So yes, there's progress, but it's definitely slower than what we expected. Uh, and we want to make sure that we do this the right way uh, rather than just do it fast. Lah. Okay, so can we see any kinds of corporate exercises coming from this iGov pillar in the next 12 months or so? I think next 12 to 24 months, I'll, I'll say that's probably a little bit more, more realistic. Okay. Uh, for the next 12 months, I remain hopeful, okay. uh, but realistic at the same time. Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so you became the CEO of the Catcher Digital Group at 2023. Then towards the middle of the year, uh, you bought the remaining 49% uh, of ETFI. It is a leading influencer platform in Malaysia for 3.43 million ringgit. You already own 51% of the company. Why did you choose to buy out the entire 49%? For us, it's a, a financial consideration. So typically how we structure majority of our deals is such that we take a majority stake and then we have an option to acquire the rest of the business. Uh, why we do that is to make sure that in some ways to de-risk our position. What if we buy 100% of something that's not good? Uh, so we buy 51% of control, we run the business, we work with the founders to grow the business. And then the second portion is uh, for us to acquire if the business turns out to be great. And but wouldn't that 
make the company more expensive to buy the remaining 49% in the future. Well, the flip side of the benefit is that we acquire the, the profit of the business. So as mm. a group, we get to consolidate the patami. Mm. And because we are uh, a public listed company, we are valued based on our patami. Mm. So that's one way for us to acquire the remaining uh, portion of the uh, profit. Okay, so rather be safe than sorry. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Well, Itifi is a leading influencer platform. So just, just out of curiosity, who are the leading influencers that you're working with? So, so Edify works across different uh, markets. So we don't have like say only one or two people that we work with, right? So depending on the, the needs of the, the customers, we will reach out to whoever that we think is suitable for the clientele. Uh, and then work according to that. So if you say, hey, like, is there one person, a big, big one that you work with exclusively? No, right? I don't think that's how the industry works. The industry works such that, hey, there is a need for a influencer marketing. How do we get the right influencers with the right audience to, to promote a campaign? So how Edify normally works is to attach to our core digital media business, right? So mm-hmm. Edify and our digital media platform uh, businesses work hand in hand. So customers mm-hmm. will come to us uh, and ask for an integrated campaign. And then as part of it, they would like influencer marketing and we will help them craft the right profile of influencers to work with. Uh, and we pretty much can reach out to most of the influencers uh, in town mm-hmm. if they needed. La. Coming back to your strategy when it comes to m and activities, merger and acquisition activities. Mm. So you buy a majority stake so that you can consolidate their numbers into the group number. And then if the company performs well, let's say 12 months, 24 months down the road, you exercise your option to fully acquire the company mm. with the extra profit that you are able to enjoy. Mm. That's on the blue sky scenario. Mm. If we turn that thing around and say today you buy a controlling stake in a company, 51%. And from that point onwards, the company keeps going down. How do you mitigate that risk? I guess as with all investments, it comes with a risk. I think it's up to us to decide how we mitigate that, right? So let's just take digital media uh, business as an example. We don't randomly go and buy businesses, right? So we have a core platform that is centered around high traffic consumer news portal or entertainment sites. So that that forms the core of it. So to your point, the first part is to make sure that the business is good to start with on a standalone basis. So it's a structure, a deal where it makes sense for us and have some kind of downside protection, right? By then we get to assigning the deal, which is probably like anywhere from three to 12 months from the starting point, we already are quite confident, right? If we're not confident, we're not going to pull the trigger, right? So so that's how we try to de-risk. We have been quite fortunate so far, most of the digital media businesses that we acquire has worked out pretty well. Some better than others for, for many different reasons. But by and large, we have not lost any money on most of them. Uh, and we've been quite fortunate. But like to say, you know, if, mm. as with all investments, uh, it comes with a risk. Uh, and this is our process to make sure that we, we de-risk the acquisition strategy. Right. How much are you spending on this uh, 51% of Digital Symphony? Oh, God, you, you caught me on the spot. I think that the, we are acquiring for like 41 million. Uh, so 51% of that, I think it's like, I think it's like 21.7 million, I think. Something along those lines. Okay. Yeah. So um, Catcher's market cap is about 100 million-ish. Uh, this deal is about 21 million. It's about 20% of the market cap. Yeah. I'm pretty sure you have some cash reserve there, but not sure whether it's enough to fully just use your uh, internal funds. So how are you going to fund this acquisition? Yeah. So when it comes to acquisition, we have sort of like an internal kind of order of uh, priority, right? So in most cases, we want to acquire businesses with our internally generated cash flow. Right. So for small businesses, smaller deals, yes, we can do that. For someone like a digital symphony, two angles, it is very specific because this deal is structured such that we don't pay the vendor until one year later. So we have the next, say, 15 months to... Wait, you, you don't pay the vendor until one year later, Yeah. but the valuation is locked in? Yes. Okay. So every deal is a little bit different depending on the context, right? Specific to digital symphony is a growing business. Right, it's, it's growing like three times, two times every single year on the profit level. And the founders feel like, hey, if my business is growing so fast, I wouldn't want to sell it at yesterday's valuation, right? Because then I'm kind of punishing myself because I know the business is going to grow with or without you, right? So we worked out, hey, actually the best way to work about this is that we set in a deal in place, but the consideration or the payment to the vendors only kicked in when they hit the number. So the deal is structured such that when they hit the 4 million profit guarantee and, and there's another one, 4.3 million uh, 24 months later, then we pay and then the deal get consummated. Right. So, okay. so in some ways you can think of it is that we acquire the business first and we pay a year later subject mm. to them hitting the performance. Okay, what if the profit comes in slightly later? So for instance, they are supposed to hit 4 million net profit 
within the 12 months. Yeah. But I use 18 months to hit it. Yeah. So do I still get the valuation or you say, hey, you didn't hit, so I'm going to penalize you. There is some form of downside protection. So because you say you're going to hit, if you don't hit, then what happened, right? You're right. going to be on the hook. So typically in most cases, specifically to a digital symphony, there's like a pro rata basis. So let's just say you hit only 90%, you get paid 90%. Uh, and then there's like a floor. If you don't even hit that, we will cancel the whole deal. Because you say you're gonna do it, but you didn't do it. Not only you didn't do it, uh, you underperform massively, right? But those are typically to comfort the public shareholders, right? Right. For, for example, because th those questions that people ask, like, what, what happens if these guys don't even hit, right? Like, mm. then it's just empty promises. So those are things that we put in place to make sure that, hey, in the worst case scenario, we are fine. We just reverse the whole thing. Uh, although we don't think that will happen, but in most cases, contracts are to protect downside and mm. those things are put in place to make sure that if, if the worst case scenario happens, uh, then we everyone get protected. So to go back to the question, how do we fund acquisition in general? Internally generated cash flow, maybe number one priority. Second is that we'll fund it with debt. Uh, and then third would be from equity perspective, right? Why, why we always think about it that way? Because we want to make sure we fund this acquisition carefully and we don't dilute our shareholders unnecessarily. So to us, my job is to create shareholders uh, value. Mm. And a big part of it is to make sure that we don't simply dilute and just do placement, which a lot of companies tend to do. Right? Because placement is the easiest thing to do. Mm. You don't have to talk to like multiple banks and figure out which financial covenant to negotiate like two times, three times that to EBITDA ratio, all sorts, right? There's like a whole laundry list of things you negotiate. Private placement is very simple. You go to the market, hey, you're gonna buy this at this price, this is what they do, please. No, uh, come, come and come and uh, subscribe, right? Uh, but the flip side is that if you do it at the wrong share price, it's highly, highly dilutive to your shareholders. And if it's bad for our shareholders, it's bad for everyone, mm. right? So to us, it's about figuring out what's the right mix of uh, funding at that particular time and then go for that. So I can't say we will never ever do uh, equity placement. We'll do it when the share price is at the right level and we think it makes sense for the shareholders to be diluted uh, slightly. When the... Uh, share price is not doing so well uh, relative to what we think it should be, then we would then do a debt fundraising and, and get the money from uh, banks, it would be other financial institutions to, to fund the deal. Uh, and because we have operating business that, that generates cash flow, generates profit, uh, there's a level of debt that's physically responsible that we are quite happy to take on mm. for the right terms. Okay, so if the share price valuation is not right, you don't mind to actually go for bank borrowings and pay some interest over there. Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah. Okay. Since the GN2 scenario, now you have a core business, which is iMedia. Therefore, safe to say that you are a media expert again, right? Um, Strong words, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you are a media expert again. But there's a saying that goes, when you want to drink milk, you don't need to buy a cow, right? Mm -hmm. And somehow you are an expert in the media business. Mm -hmm. So why do you still need to go on a shopping spree to actually acquire all these companies? Yeah. So it goes back to our kind of overarching strategy. Media as industry is fairly mature. Mm. So it's not going to suddenly grow like 200% year over year on a industry level. So on a good year, you'll trail behind the GDP, right? So the, the, the GDP grows by say 5%. Media will tend to follow. Uh, and then the question is that how do you increase the digital advertising kind of spending? And then it, it typically comes at expense of most of the traditional uh, media mm. companies. In that scenario, if you only follow and trail the market, you probably will do like 5 to 20, 30%, right? Because you're growing according to the market and then you're taking some pie away from the traditional media mm. channels. Sure, that's fine, right? We, we, can, we can do that, but we can do more. So why acquisition makes sense to grow is one, on a macro level, we have to do that if you want to grow beyond that, that 20%, 30% organic uh, opportunity in the digital media scene. Two is that, yes, right, if you want to do that, but actually, can we do that, right? Does the, the structure of the industry allow us to, to buy and build a business? Uh, and answer to us is yes, because we have shown that, hey, actually, you can bundle together different audience, different product, and, and sell to customers. And one thing, a nuance that actually a lot of uh, people gloss over about the industry landscape is that majority of our customers are large corporate MNCs, right? Uh, what that means is that, especially for the MNCs, typically how they allocate marketing budget is that every year I have X million of marketing budget. Uh, for a specific territory, I'm gonna appoint a specific agent uh, or agencies to manage the budget. And a lot of independent vendors would find it quite hard to tap into their budget because similar to a big company, agency want to work with a couple of their preferred vendors they have agreement with, long-term relationship, knows that it will work, mm. right? Because as an agent, what you want to make sure is that whatever that you run campaign uh, on for your customers or your advertisers will work, 
Mm. And the safest and the uh, uh, options that makes the most sense is to work with the ones that has proven track record that can help you bundle all these things together and with a great idea, a great creative behind it and work, right? Because of that, for smaller guys, it's, it's very hard to get advertising budget from big brands like EcoWorld or, or even like you know, Nestle's of the world. And that's where our clientele sits, right? So these are uh, clients that has budget and wants to build brand and they come to us and get access to uh, an array of products. So it makes sense that we acquire and then plug in the ecosystem for the companies that are digital publishers that were acquired that never used to be able to tap into the budget. Now they can. Mm. For us, we, we need content, right? So we know that we're not good content people, but we're pretty good at selling. Right, mm. pretty good at the client relationship. Bit. So it's a win-win solution when, when we come together, quite often the founders of the original business will continue to do what they do best and what they like, really mm. like. The reason why they started content business is not because they like selling advertising, it's because they like writing content, they like producing good, good quality content. So they're, they're going to continue to do that. Uh, and then from a catch-up digital standpoint, we'll help them take away the headache of selling an administrative part of the business, right? So the finance can be centralized, the selling process can be centralized. Uh, they continue to churn out great content, make sure that whatever that they do, uh, you know, adhere by a certain standard and certain quality, and then work with the sales team to make sure that whatever the clients needs from an advertising standpoint, mm -hmm. they can deliver it and deliver it at a high high quality standard as well. Okay, so if I may summarize it, you for your clientele, you want to be the one-stop solution center for them yep. so that they just engage you and you're able to allocate the budget based on different, different uh, digital asset classes yep. uh, for them to do effective marketing. Yep. And on the content creation side of things, these people, they enjoy creating contents, but they may not necessarily have the skills to reach out to big clients or they may not have the skills to sell. So you come in to help them to sell their products to the customer and then give them jobs, so yeah, to speak. So, so like a slight kind of addition to that is that they, it's not sometimes, sometimes they have the skills mm. to sell, but the, the industry the structure, actually no, like, they, they can also, time you can find, right? But industry structure is that it's against true, them. True, it's true. so hard, right? You're not like 100 doors to get to the right customers yeah. and it makes more sense to partner with someone that already are in the door, right? Mm. In, in the room, right? Already cross the door in the room uh, to do it. It's not that they can't. Like, I'm pretty sure with you not know, all founders are uh, like mm. yourself, right? You, you have a lot of capability to learn and, and hustle and figure it out. Sure, given enough time and enough mm. like mistakes made, you'll figure it out, right? Mm. But the question is that, how many days or how many hours, how many years will you have to go through to get to what you could have done working with us? Mm. So, so it's often, I suppose, money versus time, right? So if you want to kind of hustle your way, yes, you take, you can do it, but maybe take a bit more mm. time. You have to do a lot of things that you don't necessarily like and enjoy uh, versus, hey, come to us, we partner, uh, we do what we're good at, uh, you do what you're good at, which we both don't like what each other does. Mm. Uh, so it's like a win-win solution. So we complement each other. You also make an acquisition of this company called Headline Media for 1.24 million ringgit, 30% stake. This company, Headline Media, they own brands like Weird Kaya, Look Look Words, Easy Local. I suppose this Headline Media is very similar to us. We are Finlit Media. We also own brands like Mr. Money TV, FAQ Show, The Coffee Break and uh, stuff like that. Hmm. Well, this is, this is coming from my experience and this is truly what I want to ask you, right? Yeah. And coming from banking background as well. Yeah. So in banking, right, media is one sector that is very hard to evaluate. Say, for example, Mr. Money TV can make a viral video and like 1 million views, but next video, nobody watches hmm. zero views then how do you value these kind of companies, right? So therefore, a lot of fund managers find media industry, one industry that some fund managers don't even want to have media companies in their portfolio. Yeah. Then now, I myself involved in media business, I even find it more difficult to value it ourselves. Yeah. Because the only way that I can measure it is through the number of brands that I can build. And yep. every brand that I build, I do not know how long I can sustain it. Yep. So that's the biggest risk for me as the management of the company. So when you go into an acquisition, 1.24 million ringgit, 30% stake, just put on a table like that. What do you see in the company? Like weird Kaya today can be very good, but tomorrow it can go downhill. Yep. So yeah. Yeah, this, this is a, a question that we get asked a lot by fund managers uh, community uh, or investor community at large, right? So... When we evaluate a business, I think number one, especially a, a business like Headline Media is not generating a, a lot of revenue or profit as a business. Uh, what we are looking at is, is the potential. Mm. So then back to the, the kind of two-pronged approach I mentioned, right? hey, is the business good? And is the business good is something that we can validate pretty quickly yep. because 
a good thing about media is that, like you say, it's, it's very transparent. If you're good, you're good. Like people know about you. People got to ask about it, uh, or we can go ask the customers whether it's good or not. And then from the years of experience that, that we have had, uh, we would know, hey, like what kind of monetization capability can we generate out of it, right? So internally, we'll run a model and say, hey, within three years, can this business generate a certain level of profit? And then we backward justify, right? So today, maybe we buy a company that is maybe loss making or or at an absurd last 12 months valuation, uh, profit valuation. Uh, but we know when IMEA comes in, you can triple the revenue and every dollar that goes into revenue mm. will flow down the profit. And then we say, okay, actually in a year time, it's a six times uh, profit business or eight times profit business. In two years time, it's a five times profit business if we look project far enough. And we have demonstrated in the past that we have done similar deals in uh, other media companies that require. So that makes the conversation a little bit easier because Understand. We, we have taken the risk on the private level and we have shown it that we have done it before and it's easier to explain, hey, actually, we kind of know what we're doing. Mm. Uh, yes, of, obviously, there's risk that that comes with a media platform, maybe publishing the wrong content. We've seen that happening to our industry peers where maybe for a couple of months, uh, you decided to uh, roll out something controversial. Uh, and because of that, brands, no one associate themselves with you, right? So most of the time, brands don't just advertise because they have eyeballs, right? Mm. Many companies have a lot of eyeballs, right? But maybe it's not the right brand, right? Mm. So, so like take a good example from the Western world is a company called Vice, right? Vice, amazing content, but ultra yeah. controversial, right? Mm. So brands love it and hate it at the same time, right? And over time, they kind of attract enough brands to advertise with them. Why? Because it's too controversial. All sorts of topics that are super interesting to consumer, but brands are like, whoa, mm. like, I'm not sure if I want to be part of, to be associated with them. So it's always to maintain a certain quality of uh, journalism or uh, reporting integrity, right? In all the content that they push out. Uh, and make sure it adheres to certain standards. Right? Yeah, yeah, there are times where maybe you publish something that we think it's okay, someone thinks it's hey, not so okay, and then it comes to us and we have an honest conversation. Hey, this is what we think. It's all true, right? We're not spreading false news or, or fake news. Uh, and typically, things will, will get resolved over time. So yes, the risk is there, right? What if they don't perform anymore? But typically, if you you have demonstrated track record to be able to churn out a certain level of content that has worked out for a while, you tend to be able to do that. Uh, and then the risk is that how do you adapt to the changes of the industry or the consumer behavior to make sure that you remain relevant. So, so take for example, now short videos are very hot, right? Let's just say if we never do short videos, now we have to think about how do we adapt mm. uh, our business model to that. But those are things that as long as your ears close to the ground, uh, you have a team of people that are quite savvy with what they do, it tend not to have a big issue, I would say. Or let's just say if you're not a pioneer of something, mm. the good thing about media is that like being number one doesn't mean you're the best, right? Like mm. it's, it's being the person that does it the best. I don't see, hey, like the industry is moving towards that direction. Maybe you should do that, right? We have a, a lot of examples that we can draw inspiration, we can draw from, from abroad to make sure that our content stay relevant. So one is to maintain the quality, a status quo quality, and two is have a culture of uh, being able to, to be creative and innovate and adapt to what the consumer wants. So really for the founders, is that's their bread and butter. On one end, you know, there are some processes to make sure that things get churned out properly, but it's also a process to make sure that, hey, what, what is actually in, in the market? We need to make sure that we stay on the pulse. Anything changes, uh, we need to make sure, hey, do we want to invest into a certain new format? And then that's like a business conversation that we need to revisit uh, every year. So mm. that's a good part and the challenging part about being in the media industry because it moves really fast. Mm. The fortunate thing is that because we're in digital, we are relatively asset light. So if you want to change anything, we don't have to worry about a lot of legacy infrastructure that we need to deal with as opposed to a lot of uh, more traditional media companies that find it very difficult to, to change and could have a multitude of reasons uh, why that's very difficult to happen. That's true. Yeah. Just one last question. After this conversation, it feels like Catcher is trying to replicate its success in the past from iCar, iProperty, Ref Asia, mm. whereby you acquire a lot of uh, media assets, you bundle it together, and then you can fetch a premium in terms of valuation and exit. Am I getting the impression correctly or? Well, I, I guess only the last part is not uh, that, that <laughs> accurate. Um, I, I guess we give people the impression that we are pretty good at selling businesses, mm. but actually that is a byproduct of building a good quality business, right? So anyone that uh, has, has worked with us knows that we never talk about exit valuation. That's not how we operate, right? How we operate is that we are very thesis driven. There's a certain pillar or a certain space they want to be in we figure out how to be the number one in that particular business, right? So it could be number one in Malaysia, it could be number one in the region. And then we build a plan around that, 
right? So our our philosophy is such that, hey, if you build the great business, you're number one, there are ways that you can uh, realize your investments. So sometimes it comes in a form of extreme dividend, right? Or, or sometimes it comes in a form of someone finding it very valuable uh, and they, they want to acquire the business, right? So so take all these examples that I mentioned, like, you don't go into business and say, hey, I'm going to build this business and seven years down the road, exactly seven years down the road, I'm going to sell it to mm-hmm. an Australian you know, conglomerate and then come and acquire us. Uh, no, it's, it's very hard for us to do that. The founding principle is always build a quality business that serve a segment of the customers uh, and serve them so well. You're number one, you're the top of the choice. And one day, if a, say, you know, take iProperty as an example, we were number one in the region and REA group, when they came in, they're like, hey, we want to enter the, the, the space uh, it's very difficult for a business like that to be able to start from scratch because uh, it's a market-based business, there's a network economies in place, you have supply, you have demand. Once you once you build that, uh, it's a winner takes all environment. It's very hard for you to spin up a website and throw a lot of dollars and try to compete. It makes more sense for us to acquire into this uh, region. And, and iProperty becomes a, a very natural choice, right? Because it was already listed in Australia. Mm-hmm. The numbers are very transparent, which is a big problem in a lot of businesses in this part of the world, right? Like it's not transparent. You buy a business, you'll figure out a bunch of like hairy stuff inside the business. And then they decide, hey, you know, maybe you should have a conversation. And, and it didn't happen just like one day they turn up and they want to buy, right? They invested a certain portion of the business, uh, get on the board, understand the business very well. And then the transaction happens like a few years down the road. Uh, same goes to iCar. Uh, you know, when Kasim and, and Aika had the conversation, it's really, hey, you are very good at what you do. We are very good at what we do. Coming together is a lot better for both businesses. We couldn't have expected that Kasim would have been a natural acquirer of the business uh, and at the right price, and it makes sense for the shareholders. Uh, then, then we do a deal. So no, like to answer your question, like we don't think about how to sell, who to sell, how much to sell at the end of it. We only think about building great businesses in whatever category that we be in. Uh, and we just want to be the number one in whatever that we do. And if one day it comes to a point where uh, it makes a lot of dividend for all shareholders. Great. If uh, one day uh, someone comes to us uh, with an offer that uh, we can't refuse, and it's, uh, it's, it's our, I guess, fiduciary duty to make sure that we generate, we maximize the shareholders' return. And at that point, if the, the right uh, decision is to sell the business, then we'll do it. But uh, trust me, like we don't talk about this uh, at all, right? In, in our day to day, right? Mm. Uh, we just think about, hey, how do we build the best business, acquire the right business, grow the business, uh, you know, serve our customers well, and make sure, you know, uh, whatever I do, we we have uh, shareholders uh, kind of. Yeah. Everything uh, else interest. will fall in place naturally after that. Well, fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers fingers crossed. Cross. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, today we learned a lot about media business and apart from that, we also got a lot of insights about company acquisitions, m and and also a little bit insights about how companies like Catcher do their deals in mm. order to maximize shareholders' value. So thank you very much, Eric, for your time today. Hope to see you again uh, and hopefully by the time, you know, Catcher is one of the biggest digital media company in Malaysia and perhaps in the region as well. Thank you, Frankie. Uh, Great honor to be here. It was really fun. Thank you. All right. See you.